Okay, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to the Goiter Institute second seminar series where the focus for this seminar is on our major project, Murray Flood Ecology, which is just in the process of wrapping up and is certainly, um, as you're here today, providing some really useful information in terms of managing environmental water and managing the River Murray system and um, is feeding into all of that process uh, into the future. So before I start, um, I'm Michelle Aykroyd, I'm the Acting Director of the Institute. Uh, we're three years into a five-year program and um, certainly now starting to see some of the outcomes of our research coming to fruition. And I'm really pleased to say that we will be holding these regular seminar series on our key projects or key investment areas so we can start communicating a lot of the outcomes of that research to a much more broader audience than just our um, research and government stakeholders. So I really welcome you to this seminar and encourage you uh, to attend further ones into the future. But um, what I'd like to do now is welcome Chief Ng Yi from SADI, who is our research leader of the Murray Flood Ecology Project, to talk about some of the wonderful, I guess, research outcomes that have um, been found uh, through this research. So let's welcome Chief Ng to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, how do we operate this? Okay, remote control. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share with you about some of our research conducted uh, under the wider funded project, Murray Flood Ecology. And so, just start the slide. Uh, I'm Chi Feng Ye from Saudi Aquatic Sciences, uh, leading the uh, science team of inland waters and catchment ecology. And must mention that this project uh, is was led by Saudi, but it's a really a collaborative approach. You see that CSRO and Flinders University, LA University, they are all partners. We all work together on this project. Murray Flood Ecology is one of the first projects funded under the Guaida Institute for Water Research, and it's under the environmental water theme to provide science to underpin policies for environmental water management and environmental water planning and policy. So it's quite critical to support state through the basing plan process regarding environmental flow requirement and it's providing integral knowledge as well as enormous science behind and the team also support some of the basing pl plan ecological assessment uh, exercise. So which way should I point? That way. Sorry. As you all know that uh, riverine, <coughs> floodplain riverine ecology is strongly driven by the flow regimes. And it's really important to maintain the integrity of the flow regime. However, that uh, river regulation is, has had a great impact on the ecosystem. And this is very se severe in the lower river Murray because historically it has been a flowing river system. But now after the flow regulation, and it's turning that into a series of weir pools. So from the barrage to lock one, two, three, four, six and up, the whole river Murray is sort of chopping to a series of cascade weir pools. And during a lot of within channel flow condition, it's just sort of still, so sort of, it doesn't look like a flowing river, but it's having a very profound impact on the ecology, how things work particularly for a series of range of species and processes that they were adapted to the flowing environment. So in order to uh, support the environmental water allocation and environmental uh, water management, it is really crucial to restore the riverine flow regimes in order to rehabilitate the riverine ecosystem. So this, I just show you quickly a hydrograph. It's at the SA border, uh, SA border, basically the flow discharge into SA. 
And as you can see, those yellow lines are actually the recorded flow. But the white little dotted dashed line is the model flow, as if, if there is no development there, if there are no development. And look at, I think the pointer might be the red little thing. So if you look at the last few uh, 10 years that during that flood from 2000, during the drought period from 2001 to 2010, without the development, we would have got, sorry, we can point here. Oh, okay. Okay, so without, sorry, <laughs> not familiar with the technology here. But without development, we would have got about three overbank flood and four decent in-channel flow pulse, pulses. So basically that, you can see that all these sort of flow pulses, if without development, these would provide really important ecological sort of processes that's needed by a lot of organisms which now have declined. So uh, for environmental flow management, a lot of levers could be applied. Do we just release the water from upstream dams and coming down? If, if so, how do we reshape the hydrograph, say, to create poles? What magnitude, what frequency to benefit the environment? And can we manipulate the weir pool, either rising or lowering, to create some hydraulic diversity and also help inundate adjacent wetlands to restore some processes? And other thinking behind is about environmental regulators, how to manage wetland, how to manage major floodplain areas to operate the floodplain regulators or other environmental regulators in order to optimize the ecological outcomes but use water in a very efficient and effective manner. Are there any other ways to enhance and improve ecological outcomes? So a lot of thinking behind, and all these require science to underpin environmental water management and planning process. So what happened prior to Guida was there was a range of ecological uh, research and monitoring project conducted between 2001 and 2010. And it happened to be that during that drought period we collect a lot of baseline data in terms of biota and some of the water quality and river metabolism studies conducted during that period. And 2001, that, that's the uh, drought broke and flood came down. And a lot of questions raised saying, how is the ecosystem going to respond? And how are we going to basically capture the opportunity to undertake some investigations about ecological response, post-flood, during the flood, and see how the system recover, and whether some of things will recover after that event. So that's the Guida investment, and we have a team of among the best ecologists across a range of disciplines we go out and conduct some investigation, investigations and collect some really important knowledge. And these ones will all sort of contribute to the science knowledge for environmental water requirement and improve our understanding of what's the water benefit and how do we optimize the environmental flow management to achieve the best outcome for Lower River Murray ecosystem. Now, a simple ecological response model I'm presenting here is how we link to water management and climate scenarios to the water benefit. In order to do so, we need to understand that how you tweak the flow management and environmental water planning, how that affects the flow regime, which is the core key driver. And a lot of factors, including the flood planning inundation, wetland inundation, what magnitude, frequency, and duration of flow that you need to deliver. What is the connectivity? And also both lat lateral and longitudinal. And also within the stream, there's also that hydraulic complexity, which is really important, we found. 
So how does all this affect the ecological processes? You look at water qualities and nutrients and also groundwater processes, all these primary productivity thing. And how that affect ecological components, so typically like key biota, fish, and also about plant and macroinvertebrate and other component birds. And then we want to bring all these into a system understanding, saying how we conceptualize, if possible, develop to semi-quantitative model to look at how ecological system basically function and in response to the flow delivery and different flow scenarios. And then for the Murray flood ecology, basically we conduct a series of investigations, particularly under the riverine processes, as well as key biota response for fish and plant. And the research was conducted in the main channel as well as in the wetlands, and some are done in the floodplain. And we set up as a questions and hypothesis during that, for that flood event study. And we look at the flood coming down, how this affect the water quality and the phytoplankton assemblage within the main channel, and how these key fish species will respond, including their spawning effect, and as well as the large body fish, what is the movement, say Murray cod? during the flood event, how far they move, how do they behave maybe differently compared to the drought period. And also we, want, we look at the habitat change within the main channel in terms of submerged and emerging vegetations, how the fish assemblage association with habitat change as well as overall species composition and abundance. And we also look at wetland and regarding the fish community as well as vegetation assemblage. Do they, are they resilient? Do they bounce back? Or some of them are resistant, they still last? And what is the fish assemblage response post-flood? Uh, post and other work is done in that, uh, basically look at the bank recharge, groundwater effect, salt leaching, and the red gum health on the flood plan we we'll look at the river red gum response and also how the understory vegetation responds after the drop uh, after the drop and flood coming in so all these project basically is structured as uh, 10 research tasks as you can see from task uh, 3 to task 12 so basically individual 10 research research project in a coordinated manner and there's the overall uh, synthesis component. Uh, this is done by Flinders Uni. And they basically work on about how they all this knowledge we can contribute to the improvement of the conceptual understanding of the system response in the Lower River Murray post flood. And myself is leading the project <clears throat> as the project leader. So each project got all those task leaders named behind and across uh, various agencies, SARO, LA Uni, SADI, and CSIR, uh, and uh, Flinders University. So just to let you know, the Guaida Institute, uh, that website, most of the individual research report is available. It's actually, three or four of them have been published and as a peer review journal paper. So if you want them, you can contact me. But for the report, you can directly hop on to the website if you want to know the detail. So for the rest of the term, uh, I'm going, my background is a fish ecologist. So I'm going to talk about some key highlights, some key research regarding the fish ecology during the flood event. And my colleague from CSIRO, Rob, Dr. Rob Oliver, he's going to talk about river metabolism, and also about the red gum health. So hope you could share some of the key outcomes with us. Okay, there's a synthesis report is being uh, prepared, so we'll send to Guida very soon for review and endorsement, so which bring all these components together. 
So in the lower river Murray, there's extremely diverse uh, fish assemblages. And you've got these uh, iconic species like uh, golden perch, silver perch. Sorry, I have to point like that, or assuming, oh no. And that big one, more than a meter big, is that the Murray cod, which is really icon for the whole yeah, river Murray. And, but you also got some smaller species, more common species like uh, bonny herring, sometimes called bonny bream. And also you've got those uh, carp gudgeon, as Australian smelt, and flathead gudgeon, and hardy head. So a range of species appear in the lower river Murray. Bear in mind that they all respond differently to the flow. They have different flow and habitat requirement. And some other species like golden perch and silver perch, they really need the flow to stimulate them spawning. They are the only two species called flow cue spawners across the Murray-Darling Basin. So flow is very important for their spawning and recruitment success. And very often that they are used as indicators about what flow regime could basically restore some ecological health into the river system. Now, we, within this Murray Flood Ecology Project, that task MF1 is we look at the fish spawning response in the lower river Murray after the flood coming. So we, it's good that a lot of these uh, Murray flood ecology studies, I should mention that we actually compare with the baseline data that we collected during the extended drought period, which were funded by various funding sources like MDBA and DUNA and also NRM board. So the method about investigating spawning is we do the larval fish sampling, which is those baby fish, and we do the plantain toes within the River Murray Channel at two sites. One site is the lower part, Weir 1 is near Blanchetown, and then Weir 6 is near Renmark. So within the main channel system, we use standardized uh, plantain toe method as shown on that uh, top left graph. And we use a boat basically to tow that. There's a flow meter fixed there. You can quantify how much water is filtered through and you quantify how, how many larvae basically you collect. Now when we bring this back, it's a lot of work about sorting the samples and under the microscope, you ID them to species level. And we should mention that, again, that the work is conducted basically during that 2010 flood event. The highest flood peak is about 93,000 megaliter per day. It's overbank inundation. But <clears throat> we compare against previous data. In 2005, there was a very small channel within channel flow pulse, about 14,000 megaliter per day. And then after that, between 2006 and 2008, it's all drought period. Flow is all less than uh, 10,000 megaliter per day. So it's only about entitlement flow or even less. Some findings. The fish response basically that um, the two flow cue spawners, golden perch and silver perch, we didn't collect any small larvae between that, during that drought event, so 2006, 7, 8, not a single golden perch, silver perch were collected. They didn't spawn. And this, this graph is actually just showing golden perch with small quantitative in the, in the river, but silver perch is protected. And they follow the same pattern. And if you look at that 2006, clearly that you got nothing, 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 and 2010, boom, there is enormous increase in golden perch larvae. And adult sort of reproductive biology will also confirm there's really good spawning success during that year. And it's interesting that 2005 at Lock 6, that site 6, Renmark crossed the border, we did collect a little bit of golden perch in a smaller quantum, but we staged them, they are all older larvae, and they came from more mid-Murray spawning or upper Murray. 
that threw the lava or drift and they dispersed and came down to the lower Murray. So we're convinced that these fish were not spawned within the lower Murray system between Wellington and the border. So it's good that we found, yep, the flood event did trigger the spawning of flow queue spawners, golden perch and silver perch. Now, the next key finding is that we look at all these different larvae, not only these, but also the small body fish species. And, and you found that uh, this is a little bit complex to explain, but if you look at this whole assemblage structure, it's basically characterized by species composition and individual species abundance. So overall, we see a shift of these, uh, you see the separation, like during the drought, even 2005, all the fish that the composition and the makeup is similar, but then suddenly in 2010, the whole larval fish, the structure shift. And this is mainly driven by the increasing these large body fish, that, like I said, two of them, uh, silver perch and golden perch, Golden perch also called callop, sorry, in South Australia. And then also that you've got increased abundance in Murray cod and freshwater catfish larvae. Although that in our, based on our knowledge, Murray cod and freshwater catfish, they don't need flow to cure them spawning. They do spawn based on the temperature cues, but the flood process will stimulate the riverine productivity. So it potentially could enhance their uh, survival rate and growth rate. And also that during the drought years, you found that 100 times more abundant of the small body fish, like carp, gudgeons, Australian smelt, and all those common species, bonny herring, hardy head, they are much more abundant during the drought event. And then during the, after the flood, you saw these flip. But it's interesting to mention that river regulation, actually you regulate out those, some of the within channel flow pulses. That's very important for large body fish and with losing those, and as well as you change the magnitude and frequency of the large flood, the large body fish assemblage, those iconic species, they, they are most impacted by river regulation. So it's really great to see a response post that flood event. Now, another investigation that we look at, we, we look at these golden perch as a flow queue spawners. We look at, are they, did they recruit successfully? So saying recruit is that after they spawn, did these baby larvae, they survive and grow, and then they go into the population the following year. So for that, we did some electoral fishing along the whole lower river Murray. And one thing to mention is that this is a fish outlet. A uh, common language is also called ear bone. So that little white thing you pull out from the fish head and then you do the transverse section or you can break apart and burn a bit. It's our lab processes. And then it show the rings similar to the tree rings that you can read their age in order to know which year actually they were coming from. When did they spawn? So this one is showing a golden perch transverse section outlet. It's a 12 year old golden perch. So through this process, the left side is a size composition of golden perch and it's through multiple years from 2005, six, seven, until 2010. And the right side counterpart is, we do the aging for the whole fish uh, subsamples. And you can see that they don't actually sort of recruit or spawn in the same strength every year. You see those sporadic uh, sort of event, episodic event, and the spawning success from these, you see that 2005, 2098, and 96, those years they create some strong cohort which support a fishery and fish assemblage in the Lower Murray for Golden Perch. So a little bit background about the outlet and how you can track back about the strong cohort in the previous years. 
So under the Murray Flood Ecology Project, okay, so to mention that the strong cohorts that I just pointed to is related to these either over bank flood years, like uh, 96 or 2000, but also some is more within channel flow years, like 98 and also 2005 slash six, when there's environmental flow coming down from Bama Milawa. So going to the Murray flood ecology research. So in 2011, post flood, we do some sampling in the main channel and these two graphs is showing that in the main channel and Chaila region, as well as the Catarapco Creek region in the, around that uh, Barry area. So we do the aging as well, and you can see those zero plus fish coming out. These fish were spawned in 2010 cohort. And they did survive through first years, they come down as a strong cohort in the Lower River Murray, which is great. But interestingly, you also see some other strong cohort and the one before 2010, and then a few other years, like I just mentioned. So when we look back, say 2010, yes, it's flooding year. It sort of correspond to our conceptual understanding that this golden perch was born under the flood and also flow pulse year. And 2009, we don't have a high flow year in the Lower River Murray. So why that 2009, that cohort is still reasonably strong? And so we look at what's the influence, potential influence in upstream given that the large dynamic of golden perch, they move up and lava or disperse, juveniles drift down. So we had a look at the Darling River, what's the flow like in 2009. So the blue part is SA border flow and that black line is Darling flow. You see the little start there in 2009 in Darling, there's a reasonable flow pulse. Actually, it was the inundated, inundation flow in Darling, which triggered the golden perch spawning in that area. So those larvae could have sort of dispersed down to the lower Murray and then end up growth and survive and contribute to the fishery. So that's amazing. Even they don't spawn within the lower Murray, there's also some recruitment dynamics. It really matters for the lower Murray population. So as I mentioned that the outlet, and we got a technique like Brenton Zambetti, my colleague, they analyze the outlet, they drill through the core of the outlet and do the chemical analysis in order to do the isotope analysis. So you can sort of match with where the fish spawn because they would pick up those ambient environmental characteristics. And so in the outlet, you have those isotope uh, character in that. So it's interesting that year's fish 100% it match with the Darling River stable isotope in terms of strong team. So we got a technique basically to roughly identify where the fish is coming from, when did they spawn, in order to basically structure saying how these recruitment dynamics matters. Actually, it's very large scale. But it's really important also to maintain the spawning population in the Lower River Murray because it will allow you to create a highly dynamic and robust population, just not relying on one single source. Now there's another component I want to uh, touch on is about Murray Cot movement study. During 2010, uh, we take about 45 Murray Cot in the Chaila system and I'll show you some text, that's a Murray cot. So the right top part is some radio tag. There are large ones and small ones to accommodate big Murray cot and relatively smaller Murray cot. And the left hand side is a little pit tag. It's called passive integrated transponder. A lot of fish have been put in with that. And if they move through some fish ways that's established in the lower river Murray now, 
they can pick up the signals about where this Murray cod goes, whether upstream or downstream, through some data analysis. So Brenton and colleague, they did this tracking work. What they found is, this is mainly looking at Chila and the adjacent main river Murray and upstream and downstream. So typically in 2010, you found a range of movement patterns there in Murray cod. You got some localized movement, about 30 feet percent of fish, because they have this site fidelity. They like to hang around near their home. But also, you see a lot of fish actually, they frequently move between the Chala different kind of ephemeral creek system, and then they come to the main channel of the lower Murray. So frequently move, moving out to the main channel and to the Chala's Anna branch system. But also about 30% of the fish, you see this large scale movement, more than 100 meters. Some go to go across the border upstream, up to lot 11, and then some, a few go downstream. So it's interesting that we, we didn't find this during the drought period. It seems to be that because river is not connected, they more sort of reside near within the vicinity of Chila system. Now it's interesting that we should uh, mention all these radio tech fish. They were found that uh, to be affiliated with either residing the main channel flowing habitat or within some key creeks within the Chila system. None of them were found actually access to the ephemeral flat plain or intermittent kind of flat runners. So this sort of imply that Murray Cod actually they do prefer main channel or major Anna branch areas and with the flowing habitat that environment. And it's very important to mention that because of this frequent movement of Murray Cod between the main channel and the Anna branch systems, so any of these kind of structures, either previous structure or current structure, we need to consider about fish passage to accommodate fish up to a meter Murray Cod. So that connectivity is very important. And as well as allowing them to move hundreds of kilometers upstream, so through fish passage that has been installed now. Now, not everything's good news that uh, because of the black water event during the, during the flood, I think actually post the flood, between February and April, there was a massive uh, sort of Murray cod die, 25% is quite a significant amount. From our tag fish, 25% of Murray cod died during that hypoxic event. And so, Majority of these fish are larger fish among the tech fish, so they are more vulnerable to the black water event and hypoxic event. So that's, that's uh, unfortunate. It's putting extra pressure to the Murray cod population in the lower river Murray because we, yeah, the, the population has declined and there isn't too many new recruits in the past 20 years. But the only good news is that through our more recent assessment, so 2011, 2012, and 2013, only 2013, about May, we start to pick up some new recruits, two-year-old fish, which actually was spawned during the flood event. So that's great. There might be a lag time in detecting how many yeah, new recruits coming through Murray Cod. Now, another thing to flag and mention is our wetland fish assemblage assessment. We did see some responsive range of uh, native species, but the most responsive species to the inundation of floodplain and wetland was carp. You know that carp is an exotic species, but they are flood opportunistic species. They will respond to natural flooding or the artificial inundation of certain wetlands and floodplain areas. And it's interesting, during that uh, drought event, actually carp population has been, has declined in the lower river Murray, but after the flood, they are coming back. It's not avoidable. 
But important thing is that we're thinking that when we manage the environmental flow, when we manage the environmental water re regulators, we definitely need to bear that in mind about how to mitigate the risk of carp in order to maximize the benefit to native fish. All right, a brief recap about some key messages under the fish studies under FME. So flow is a very important driver, and the range of fish species, they will respond differently to flows. The small body fish, they will spawn and recruit during the low flow event. As a matter of fact, they are very abundant in the low river Murray and in the wetlands. But large body fish, they need flow. So Murray cod and freshwater catfish, even they don't need the flow to stimulate spawning but they need flow probably to provide food supplies to enhance their recruitment, so survival and growth. What happened? So, and golden perch and silver perch, they are flow cue spawners. They will need flow pulse or flood plan inundation to stimulate them to spawn. But it's interesting also the recruitment of flow cue spawners, that's associated with both in channel flow pulse and the flood plan inundation, and possibly their recruitment dynamic is much larger scale than within the SA boundary. So river regulation have had a major impact about removing those in channel flow pulses, which are really important for within channel hydraulic complexity, and it could have direct implication for a number of fish species. But it's really good that these kind of flow event, we actually can manage through the environmental flow management, right? Redesign the hydrograph, manipulate the wheel pool, basically to maximize the outcomes in order to restore some ecological health to the lower river Murray. And also that I talk about golden perch life history strategy, I talk about Murray cod moment, a lot of these migratory fish species, they work in a much larger scale. They don't recognize state boundary. So we need to basically look at life history of key organisms and to match the environmental flow management to cope that, to serve that need. So it's a much larger scale like river scale rather than site scale and a specific wetland scale. So we might need to consider much broader approach. And also that we should emphasize that lateral connectivity, longitudinal connect connectivity is really important. And Rod will emphasize that as well about the nutrient dynamics regarding that aspect perspective. So again, about the whole system flow management, it need to be considered for environmental water planning and flow management. A dot point about carp, given that carp is highly responsive to flows and they are flat, plan opportunist, flat opportunistic, they prefer wetlands to basically spawn and breed. So when we manage the environmental flow, we really need to consider manage the carp risk in order to bias the benefit toward native fish. And this can be done through strategic environmental water delivery as well as using innovative control technology to manage the carp population. All right, I'll leave it there and I'll pass to my colleague, Rob Oliver, to talk about river metabolism and river red gum health. Thank you, Rob. Ah, right, so I'm probably just going to talk about metabolism in, uh, uh, because uh, it connects directly to the fish, I think, uh, in an important way, as you'll see. Uh, but I'm first of all going to have to do a bit of a crash introduction because I don't know how much people know about metabolism in these systems, about what we're measuring. Yep, it's coming. And uh, how we're measuring it, the implications of it, and particularly the implications for environmental flow management. Thanks. So. The part of our project that I'm going to talk about was the floodplain influences on metabolic activity in the river. 
And as you all know, biological systems require energy to be able to structure them and to maintain their function. Uh, and supplies for the rivers come from plants and organisms that photosynthesize within the river itself, of course, photosynthesis, but also material that's washed in from the floodplain, so the detritus of le uh, leaves and other organic detritus. And it's that that forms the food resources for the river. The energy and material that comes in is passed through aquatic food webs, but of course it's passed through in different ways. And so we have a complex food web where everything is interacting uh, in a complex way. But over here I've given a simpler version of it, more linear version. And here where we've got the plants growing in the river, you get, of course, uh, the normal primary and secondary consumers going to higher levels. If you have external carbon coming in, its pathway is much more through the microbial loop, uh, introducing much more bacterial uh, and fungal activity within the system. And so the balance between these two sources of carbon is not only critical for an overall energy supply, but critical for the source of the material and critically critical for shaping the actual structure of the food web through the trophic linkages. And so it's important really if you're going to manage a system and want to understand how you can structure uh, the food webs within that system, you need to know how the energy supplies are underpinning that. So of course regular supplies are expected to come from the floodplain during floods and that these will sustain uh, the food webs. We've had, of course, reduced flooding in the Murray. That's disconnected the floodplain from the river in, uh, in much more than it used to be. So environmental watering should consider not only that reconnection from the point of view of putting water onto the floodplain to sustain the vegetation that's out there, but also it must be looking at how that water is going to reconnect back into the river channel and supply food resources. Really at the moment there are no suitable methods for assessing uh, this functional condition of the river system. Uh, certainly not methods that are widely accepted uh, by environmental flow managers. So the objective here was to demonstrate the floods were a major source of organic material in the South Australian Murray, link this to the sort of areas of inundation to try and help identify um, environmental flows using metabolism measurements. So just quickly now, so river metabolism measurements estimate the production of, photo, of material in the river through photosynthesis. They look at the breakdown of material through respiration and uh, they provide us overall with a measure of the energy supply to the system. They help us identify different sources of food supply, assess the energy pathways and we can relate that to food web characteristics as I've said. And here I'm really just showing that we use oxygen uh, concentration to look at our metabolism. Everything respires, so it consumes oxygen, both in the light and the dark. Of course, in the light, plants produce oxygen through photosynthesis. So if we do a set of measurements, which would go through the dark and light periods, we can be able to we can begin separating out the respiration from the increase due to photosynthesis, and we can pull apart, if you like the primary components of the metabolism. So we use oxygen uh, to do these measurements. We have a simple setup. Uh, we have a probe that sits in the open river measuring the oxygen concentration. This tells us the metabolism of the whole system, what's in the plankton, what's occurring attached to the surface, whether it's macrophytes, whether it's uh, biofilms. We can estimate the total uh, metabolism going on within the river. But we also have a plankton chamber which just collects uh, water from uh, the flowing part of the river and that gives us an idea of how much metabolism is carried out by the plankton, so largely microalgae and zooplankton and those organisms that are suspended in the water column. Here's just a typical result. We have light. Light drives photosynthesis of course and so as light increases your oxygen concentration increases photosynthesis then in the dark, there's respiration. So using those measurements of oxygen, we can understand how metabolism is changing in the river. So the sorts of patterns we've seen in river metabolism, this is when the flow is within channel. And so during the flood period, nearly 10 years, not continuous measurements, but measurements taken at 10 years, over 10 years, during 
uh, that period, and in flowing parts of the river, this is normally what we saw. The open water measurement, if you remember, the total system, production, reasonably high, uh, and mainly accounted for, what's the photosynthesis in blue, mainly accounted for by the plankton. So virtually all of the photosynthesis was being, all of the production in the river was being generated by the microalgae suspended in the water column. There was a small non-planktonic component. Uh, this was generally due, in fact, to uh, biofilms. Uh, there are not that many macrophytes growing in the Murray anymore. Respiration was the same, quite significant respiration. And in fact, on an annual cycle, the respiration balanced production and net production was zero in the system. But the plankton, again, accounted for most of the respiration with only a small component by the uh, rest of the system. Then when we came to the flood period, of course, uh, everything changed. As we might expect, respiration rates were enormous, 10 times the rates that we'd seen before, driven by the organic material coming in off the floodplain. Photosynthesis was actually quite a similar level in the open water. However, there was almost no planktonic photosynthesis. The reason for that is that the flood water is dripping down the river. It's deep, it's turbid, there's not much light. The plankton can't photosynthesize. Yet it's, because we just do this by difference, the non-planktonic is the difference between the open water and the planktonic, I should have said that. It appears that the non-planktonic part, that that part that's associated with the bottom or attached, is carrying out photosynthesis, and that can't be possible under these conditions. Also, the respiration, which is very high in the open water, is not accounted for by planktonic. And so either this respiration, this huge respiration, is all residing in the bottom of the river or it's coming from somewhere else. And so the question was really where is this production occurring and where is this respiratory activity uh, occurring and what does that mean about the system? We look, went back to have a look at the data because these are odd results. And what we found was that here is the yellow is the light curve we found that our oxygen curves were offset from the light curve. They didn't line up. These, according to these results, photosynthesis was occurring in the middle of the night. And in one part of the river, it had shifted four hours. And further down the river, we could follow the same curve, it had shifted 10 hours. So clearly there was a site where the photosynthesis was occurring, probably where the respiration was occurring, that was upstream, and that signal uh, was being transported down in the flowing water. It wasn't occurring in the water, it had occurred somewhere else, and it was being transported downstream. Uh, we also found in some places multiple peaks of uh, production, once again occurring in the dark. What this enabled us to do was, by lining these up with the light curves, we could estimate how far uh, this uh, production, if you like, had shifted, and then relate it to the source that it had come from. We were working in this section from the border, Cowler, down to uh, Lock 2, and uh, we had several sites. Site 5 was here at, uh, just downstream of uh, Lock 5, just at the end of Cowler, and the oxygen curves had moved there, and when we looked to see where they'd come from, they'd come from just a bit upstream, but deep in the shallow uh, floodplain area. We had a site just upstream of Lock 4. It had one major peak. And when we looked at its source, it too came from the outlet of the Cowler floodplain. We had a site at uh, Site 3 here, Lock 3. When we looked, it had two peaks at this point. When we looked at the major peak, it came from just upstream. But its minor peak came from up at the floodplain. We had another site at, uh, at Lock 2, and when we looked at it, it had two peaks. When we looked at its major source, it came from this section. And when we looked at its minor source that travelled further, it too had come from Chowla. And so what we'd found really was that although the water is flowing through this system and flooding out onto the floodplain, the major sources of the photosynthesis that we were seeing in the river and in probably the respiration 
was coming from two critical parts uh, of this system. Even though there's quite extensive floodplain through here, these two sites were providing massive input to the system. I think this is pretty important if we're going to try and manage these systems. So from the point of view of metabolic activity, uh, as I say, photosynthesis and respiration due to metabolism were due to metabolism on the floodplain as well as in the channel. The photosynthesis was associated with a large phytoplankton biomass, which we saw generated during the flood, and it had uh, grown in the flood waters. Respiration was likely due to microorganisms in the floodplain waters and carried back into so the implications here are that floods are an important source of organic material, we probably knew that, but there are critical areas of inundation. And it's not just area, because we've looked at area, some parts of the floodplain are more important than others to this. And I assume it's due, it's due in part to their connectivity to the river, how quickly the water, or how the water moves through the system and back to the river, and also that will be influenced by their geomorphology. So what are the characteristics of the floodplain that are going to really improve uh, the metabolism in the system and resupply uh, material for the organisms, including fish, to live on? Uh, so the flow patterns also need to be considered, of course, inundation, duration, because that's going to uh, determine how things grow out on the floodplain. But also a full analysis. So this is just one small reach the river really with a couple of floodplains on it. What is happening along the 2,000 kilometres of river? Are there patches like this everywhere that we really need to be focused on? Uh, and how will that all tie together in delivering material to South Australia uh, and for the food webs that we have down here? Now, I won't go on to red gum, uh, seeing we're out of time, but there was a final, can we jump to the very final slide? Because it kind of summarises probably again some of these things. Um, so sorry, this is all of the year then. No, sorry, the year slide, yeah. Do you want to talk to me So overall message, uh, just to recap a few things about the overall study, uh, we learned that environmental water management, actually we shouldn't limit to a site or a reach, as I mentioned before. The system scale, river scale, that management would be more appropriate, at least need to be considered. And sometimes you might need to consider about multi-years regime in order to achieve the outcomes. Second thing to re-emphasize is about this lateral longitudinal connectivity of flows, as well as the transport. So Rob talked about the carbon and some other studies about nutrient flows from upstream down and from the floodplain to the main channel, which basically supply that the whole energy and the whole system going. So that's really important about holistic approach and maintain the river continuity. Interesting, some of these message, or message already captured by environmental water managers that they start to look at. The flow source, how we manage that to basically facilitate that river continue to ensure that we maximize the ecological outcomes. And also, it's important to mention that uh, we did advance our knowledge, knowledge through the event, through various investigations. But the all, overall system understanding, there are still gaps. And for example, that a lot of ecohydrology, like when, when we start to do the modeling, see different flow bands, how that affect river channel flow dynamics. And what is the linkage to biological response? That ecohydrology or hydroecology, that knowledge still need to be further advanced. Now, an important thing that Rod and I both agree that it's the trophic dynamics about the whole food web. We understand various components about 
river metabolism, carbon, and how nutrients work, and how fish recruitment pattern response aligning with flow pattern. But the overall integral food web shift under different flow scenarios, we need to further understand that and hopefully gradually build a more system model, which is really important for the trade-off analysis because managers, they can't just manage a single biota or single parameter. They need a system approach. And finally, I think I would like to re-emphasize that the robust science and also the long-term monitoring is really critical. Only through these long-term data collection and we understand that how the system change and we gradually learn from that. And all these will support adaptive management for environmental flow allocation for SA. All right, thank you very much. Got a chance for questions, so Rod, maybe you want to oh, like yeah. come on, you can do it. I can. Any questions um, to clarify what you've heard from today's talk, or what the implications of the talk might be? You can just say your name and where you're yeah. from. Yeah. Lucero Bergarai from Flinders. Uh, it's a question to you. Okay. Thank. Um, uh, this large-scale approach to environmental flow um, supports very well some of the patterns that you see for the large body fish, such as golden perch. But a large and perhaps the largest fraction of the fish biodiversity is represented by very small fish. Not as medium, not as small medium bodied fish, but as small fish. And there is very, uh, there is growing evidence that the small fish are not moving much uh, uh, along the system. So what's your view about what's happening with small fish and how can we perhaps think about environmental flow that also take into account that hidden biodiversity there? Thank you, Luciana. I think it's a really good point. Uh, I think under the fish learnings as the first stop point, I did sort of flag and I didn't have chance to talk about some of my colleagues' study about assemblage shift during the flood compared to drought. You're right that uh, I basically highlight that different species, different flow gears, they will respond differently to flow, so they have different requirement. And the large body fish, work, they, they do work very large scale, but small body fish, they could work within the wetland scale. And it's a lot of actually uh, threatened species, particularly small body fish. If you protect certain wetlands, when they're out of water, environmental water is provided at the right time and in the right place, it actually saves the whole threatened species population. So sorry that I, I wasn't trying to exclude those kind of approaches, but it's just that traditionally like eFlow tend to manage in a smaller scale without thinking about the overall connectivity. So definitely, I think a combination of approach is required. And some of the flow models is being developed based on different flow queues of fish in eastern state, New South Wales and Victoria. They start to put into test about how can we deliver different flow regimes to meet different fish requirement. So a typical example, say golden perch and Murray cod, they're much longer leaves, say Murray cod, the oldest we age is 48 years old, golden perch, at least 26 year old. You don't need to deliver environmental flow, the same pattern every year to just look at the golden perch. They might need successful uh, spawning once every three years or every five years, but smaller fish, actually it's important that small body fish, a lot of them are per annual you need to also care for about some managing smaller habitat and in order to sustain their population. And one thing that I think Luciana have done a fair bit is threatened species studies. And those species like purple spotted gudgeon, pygmy perch, southern and yarra, and also purple, um, all these fish basically they are, and Murray Hardy head, they are all classified as flood plant specialists. 
That's why they gone sort of almost like extinct or threatened because those flood inundation doesn't occur as frequent as pre-regulation and these populations are under threat. So we need to look at what's their requirement and to address different need. Sorry, did I answer your question? No. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess after the prolonged drought and the response, just from your perspective and experience, is that a typical type of flood response that you'd expect or were there implications because of the prolonged drought beforehand and are there some perhaps other things that were observed that perhaps might not have been um, historically um, the type of response you'd get with a flow? Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I think it's pretty well established now that, uh, you know, the severe black water event uh, was a function of the fact that uh, uh, organic material had been able to build up on the floodplain for a much longer period of time than it previously would have, so there was not a, more a regular cleansing of this material off the floodplain. And so uh, I think black water events happened in the past. I don't think that they're something uh, that had never occurred before, but the intensity and uh, coverage of that, you know, nearly the whole river was forced below two milligrams of oxygen per litre at one stage. Um, that doesn't give many places for fish to hide out, really. Uh, so I think that was a severe case because of that. I think just uh, one small thing to add in. This is, again, another component of study about understory vegetation, about re resilience and resistance. Jason Nicole found that <coughs> some of the assemblages, you need those artificial watering to maintain them going or to maintain a biodiversity hotspot if needed. But some other species, they are very robust. They can carry on at least up to that 10 years drought, but we don't know if it's 12 or 13. So not sure, yeah. Um, question from Rod. Um, that photosynthetic pulse that you were tracking that came out of Chowler and other floodplains, um, just wondering if the magnitude of that peak was maintained as it made its way down the river moat. Um, and any comment on the possible effect of weirs um, on that peak? So it was surprising really how far the peak moved, but the peak did dissipate uh, as it went downstream as you'd expect because of there's an air water exchange at the surface. Uh, and so you would expect that there would be some uh, re-aeration of the water which was at low oxygen and then you might lose that peak or, or the peak itself may be drawn down by respiration. But it, it did diminish as we went downstream. Um, so I'm not really saying that that peak of oxygen is important. It's an indicator of the production that occurred, I believe, on the floodplain. And really that production was down to phytoplankton that were out in the flood waters. In other words, it's really the return of those organisms uh, that's really the important part. They're driving that oxygen peak because there's so much and there's uh, so many of them and the conditions on the floodplain where the water is shallow and the light can get through. Uh, supports their photosynthesis. But that means that there's increased production. You know, that production presumably is an increased, uh, increased organic load back to the river as well. You know, I, I said presumably because, of course, some of that material could remain out on the floodplain following the flood. Um, but a lot of it is in suspension when it comes back into the river. There's a lot of material in suspension, including not only phytoplankton, but zooplankton. We know from other parts of the study uh, enormous numbers of zooplankton uh, that are feeding off this algal biomass all out on the floodplain, um, which I think now is critical really to, to generating that organic material. Uh, but I don't have a measure yet for how important that might be compared to the traditional view, which the org is that the organic material is coming from detritus that's being left on the floodplain from terrestrial vegetation. I think 
there's still some interesting questions there. Any other questions? If not, I'll ask you to join me in thanking the two speakers once more. And we do have um, some refreshments for if people want to stay around and ask a few questions or meet new people afterwards, that'd be great. Just allow me to say one thing. I work in Saudi Aquatic Sciences and we will have an open day uh, on 17th of November, if you are interested to come through. Saudi does yeah, both marine and freshwater work. A lot of things related to fisheries and aquaculture and environmental science. So welcome. I supposed to bring a bun bundle of uh, flyers, but I forgot about it. Yeah, but it's all on the website. Yeah, Persa and Saudi website. If you type in, thank you. Yay, yep. Tanya, yeah, that's, champion. That's West Beach. West Beach. Yeah, it's at West Beach Saudi Aquatic Sciences. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Elfolk.